Hello, and welcome to Kansans Responding to Community Mental Health, a guide for local health departments. We're excited for this opportunity to take you on a journey to how we got to where we are today. Before we get started, let's meet our presentation team. I'm Julianne Walker, and I am a program specialist here with uh, Wichita State University Community Engagement Institute uh, Center for Public Health Initiatives. Uh, I joined this team about a year and a half ago and came to this work um, mostly from a career in social services um, and working in nonprofit organizations. When I joined the team, I was able to jump in on the work that was being done on this behavioral health project we're going to be talking with you a little bit about today. And I was especially thrilled um, just after hearing the story of how the project began and kind of where where its roots are um, here in Kansas in one of our, our counties. And so you'll hear a little bit more from Tom uh, in just a little bit about that story, but um, I'm going to go ahead and let Aaron and Tom introduce themselves and then we'll get started. My name is Aaron Davis. I'm with the Center for Public Health Initiatives at the Community Engagement Institute at Wichita State University. And so I am interviewing Tom Langer, who has helped us tremendously with this project. So uh, real quick, I've been in public health since 2006. I uh, kind of bounced around the system here in Kansas and have been at Wichita State University for nine years now. So Tom, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself really quick? Sure. I'm Tom Langer. I uh, am the administrator of the City Cali County Health Department in Cali County, Kansas, and I'm also the county's public health officer. I've been in Cali County for almost eight years now, and that's hard to believe. And, and before that, I had worked for the Kansas Department of Health and Environment for about 10 years. So I came from Topeka to Cali, and, and, and I went from the state level to service delivery level and, and uh, uh, have enjoyed it ever since. And uh, I've just embraced this because, you know, public health, it truly is a calling. You, you've got to, you've got to either believe in it or, or, or not. And, uh, over the last few years, I believe, you know, <laughs> and, and I, and I hope, I hope we can restore it all to its, to its luster and glory again, even after the, even after the pandemic. So. All right, well, thanks for that, Tom. And yeah, you let's bet. go ahead and dive in. Local health departments are crucial partners for communities working to improve behavioral health. In Kansas, partners created a framework and a guidance document to help local health departments engage with behavioral and mental health issues, um, regardless of their size, rurality, and starting infrastructure. Participants will leave this session today learning about some of our lessons learned and with recommendations for others considering a similar approach. Come with us today to learn the story and follow the journey. Let's listen in as Aaron and Tom take a step back in time to what prompted work on this project. Thanks for joining us on this uh, adventure we have going on. Glad to be here. Well, hey, uh, I kind of want to jump right into it as we start talking about kind of the efforts that we've had and, and the document that we're presenting on. I just want to really jump into what got all of this started. And I don't know if you remember the conversations we had back in June 2018. We were at mm -hmm. the uh, kind of a, a meeting for local health department directors. Mm -hmm. And you had some stuff that was really kind of weighing on you at that point, yeah. some events in your community. So I just want to know if you could just start us off, help set the scene for this whole uh, adventure sure. and kind of tell us what, what was going on back then. Uh, the spring of, of that year, of course, this was you know pre-pandemic and everything else. We were going along and, and we had a rash of suicides uh, that that uh, critically affected the teen population, and by that I mean the like the middle school, high school age group, just really rocked us. Uh, we had within a period of probably about forty five days, four four people end their lives, mm -hmm. and you know each one was tragic, and each one was not foreseen it seemed like and uh, and and we were in a conundrum about what's bringing this on what's happening what are we not seeing and so i rem i remember distinctly 
asking some of the other, uh, you know, some of my peers at that meeting, are any of you having this same type of, you know, occurrence happening in your counties? And if so, what are you doing or, or where do we begin? And uh, there was just a, a feeling of, you know, total frustration because this was not something that we as health departments were always involved in. But when, when it hit that kind of critical mass, it certainly ended up on my desk with a lot of questions from people. And so I didn't have the answers and, and I asked and everybody kind of looked at me with the same thing. And, and then you approached me and we spoke about it and I gave you the details and, and, and that, you know, that was, gosh, I can't believe it. You know, it's four or five, almost years ago now that, that that's happened, but uh, that's how the, that's how it got started for us. And, and that's where we were at at that point in time. Yeah. One, well, you know, with our work at our center, just trying to help support health departments. I mean, I think I kind of immediately jumped in knowing that you, we've got to do something. You weren't the only one having uh, these types of issues, but I think you were probably the most vocal about it at that point. Yeah, it was, it was kind of a low, a low time, you know, it was, yeah. uh, you, you don't expect to see that in the county our size. And, and so, you know, it, it, again, it was like, what do we do this this was not what i was trained for you know and uh, we we had to do something which I, I think probably leads into my next kind of follow-up question of uh you know without getting into all the details you're from a smaller community there about thirty-five thousand, so it's actually one of the larger counties in the state but why was this coming to your desk? Why why did you feel like you had to be one of the one of the main players getting involved? You know, Aaron, I think one of the, the low points of it was when I spoke to one of the families. You know, and uh, one of the parents looked at me and says, You've got to do something. Now, when you're faced with that kind of blunt reality you can't stand back and say, oh no, I'm in public health. The mental health component isn't my, isn't my area of, of expertise, which it wasn't, you know, it, by, by no means where I, would I stand in front of somebody and say, I understand the intricacies, you know, of this kind of despair, but um, that opened me up to really looking at that wholeness of individual health and and what the role public health plays in it and i already knew um that not just in our county but everywhere it seems like there was a lack of available services mm -hmm. for this type of situation where you had you had young adults or teens or anybody really having problems that that could get adequate help we really weren't paying that close of attention to it we were responding to the crisis we were trying to to be understanding and clean up the mess and we were just wringing our hands saying oh oh poor poor us what do we do and and you know it comes a point in time where you have to accept ownership of something and say you know mental health is part of public health as a matter of fact i, I don't i don't believe that there's a separation in that now mm -hmm. that that has happened over the last few years and uh, and so we we had to take a look at it holistically the openness that Tom had at that time to share the fears and discouragement he was feeling and his willingness to ask for help was something that Aaron just could not ignore. Um, he immediately went back and engaged the team at WSU, um, Wichita State University, and took Tom's story and his desire to move the needle and began to turn it into action. The team did some research um, on what was currently happening within local health departments around behavioral and mental health. We also looked at how other entities and organizations were looking at behavioral health within their current structures. This research led us to a framework that was developed out of New York State for advancing the integration of behavioral health into primary care. This particular framework was developed by Dr. Henry, Henry Chung and Dr. Harold Pincus. Their framework included key guidance and underlying steps to help advanced integration into practices regardless of organization size or resource constraints. 
it also provided a starting point for us to take a look at how some of this information could be translated into something that would fit the foundational landscape of public health and health departments across Kansas. Knowing that local health departments in Kansas are not typically structured to provide primary care services, we needed to explore other ideas around um, other types of integration of behavioral and mental health and or creating opportunities for community coordination um, of refer referrals and also resources. We worked from the, belief, the following beliefs about Kansas health departments. We know that local health departments carry credibility in their communities. We also know that people understand that health departments can help and manage in crisis situations. Um, local health departments possess many strengths and are often those leaders of innovative work and partnerships within their communities and the counties they serve. So it makes good sense that local health departments have some involvement in behavioral health, mental health, and overall community well-being. We realize that this does not have to be a full integration of behavioral health or mental health services within the scope of the local health department. It simply means finding ways to connect to the issue and support the needs of the community. The frustration, the desperation, I think is what it was more than anything was, what do we do? How do we begin? How do I go back and tell people we're going to look at this and, and do it when I had no idea where to start? Yeah, well, let's talk about that a little bit, because, you know, when we had our conversation, I didn't know where to start either. <laughs> and I think you know, it was probably 12 months of conversations, facilitated meetings, uh, research. And I mean, I don't think we made a whole lot of progress in figuring out, you know, what is something that can not just help you, but other health departments as well, figure out this role. And then we kind of stumbled upon this framework uh, we borrowed some of the concepts of, you know, instead of thinking about behavioral health, mental health integration in a health department as this big encompassing element, like, you know, it's 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 really bite-sized. There's actually just certain areas you can kind of focus in on. And so we did a lot more research onto what those elements looked like and and how to make progress in them. And then we started you know, convening our design team. So, you know, there's two elements. There's there's some of the research that we were doing and and trying to dive deeper with you and some other health department directors, as well as what you were doing kind of on your own, right? And, and kind of some of the things that you've been doing there. Through the process of convening a design team made up of Wichita State University Community Engagement Institute staff, um, Kansas Department for Health and Environment partners, and also local health department directors, um, and offering presentations at state convenings for feedback and input, um, a guidance document, kind of a toolkit of sorts, was developed. This guide, um, being a toolkit of sorts, is designed to provide information and other tools and ideas that utilize local public health expertise and also programs to strengthen behavioral and mental health eff efforts in communities. It includes four main pillars, or what we also call domains, to address the primary areas in which behavioral and mental health uh, might be most effectively addressed by local health departments. These areas include workforce development, organizational structure, clinical workflow, and community efforts. Within each of these domains, information about best practices provided, along with guidance for varying levels of engagement and activities, really based on where the local health department is in its current practice. The purpose of the document is to provide guidance um, to be for LHDs to begin to expand or um, test applications of public health approaches to community behavioral and mental health needs, um, understanding that not all health departments in Kansas look the same. The tools and recommendations are tiered such that each level of integration may be considered in the context of each community's needs and resources or lack of resources. Additionally, the tiered approaches are not an all or nothing approach. They're offered for consideration in what we look at as preliminary, intermediate, and advanced activity levels. Using this Q, uh, QR code that you see here on the screen um, or going to the website listed here, the full guide is available and it's on our Kansas Public Health Collaborative website for you to use, access, share, um, 
tweak whatever whatever might work best for you but we want this to be um, a collaborative document that anyone can pick up and use and kind of find a, a place to start so finding and deciding where to start is really very individual um, for organizations to decide so let's listen in to tom to see where he got started i don't know if you just want to give us kind of a highlight of some of the yeah. some of the things you've been doing well, you may you make a you know, perfect point about the fact that we uh, we had to do something. You know, the the status quo was never going to be good mm -hmm. enough at the, at this point. Um, couldn't give it just plain lip service. And the elephant in that room was enormous. And you know, we always talk about those metaphors. You can't eat the elephant, so you take it you know one bite at a time. And so for us, it was just trying to figure out well what can we learn? What can we do? How can we as individuals change behavior, you know, internally in, in, in the domain that I control, which is the health department. So, you know, that's 20 staff members, you know, two locations. Uh, we interact with, you know, we have tens of thousands of appointments every year. And so how do we change little things to, to start making a difference? And, not only that, but how do we become better aware of noticing the signs? You know, it's just like if we had somebody come in and, and they were running a fever and they had a sore throat, we'd say, well, these are symptoms of, a, of an mm -hmm. illness. How could we learn, you know, what to look for um, in, in the work that we did to, to where we might be able to um, employ some, you know, proven practices or tools or, or whatever to give us a better understanding of where an individual might be on a specific day and time. And, you know, it, it was scary to think of, we have licensed nurses and practitioners and people that are there. And then when we sat down and we talked about it in a group, I told them, look, guys, I'm not trying to make you psychologists or, you know, anything like that. I, I just want us to be more aware. And, and, and we employed best practices that we could find, you know, sometimes a, a little diagnostic tool that would just be a little questions that, that get answered when they come in, when a person comes in for an appointment um, that we knew would, would, might, might help us better determine. And then we, we uh, brought in um, trainers to the community for us to send staff to, uh, you know, the, the mental health awareness uh, courses, which really helped. I mean, it, it, allowed us to think about it in a different way and, and to, to start breaking down the, the uh, stigmas perhaps associated with, you know, mental stress and, and uh, mental health issues and crises. And, um, those things really, really worked out. And that's where it all began. You know, it was, it was the one thing. It was just like, guys, if we can come in every day, even when we're not feeling so great, and put a smile on our face and say nice things to people, you know, the, the impact that might have on their day could be quite profound. And so we began saying, let's, let's do what we can control. Let's do what, what I can do as a person, what you can do as a person. And it started with just with those interactions from person to person, a smile and, you know, a, thanks. We're glad you're here, you know, as opposed to, Oh, what do you want? Kind of a thing. So, so there was that, that difference in, in just mindset and posture and you might think, oh, that's really a silly thing, but I'm telling you, it, it's not. It, it's it works, and and we've seen the we've seen the proof in that. So that's where we started. Tom has started some of the work in his area and within within his department in several of these domains that are offered within the guidance document that you see here on the slide. So let's dive a little bit deeper into, into what each of these domains are. Um, we'll start off with workforce development. Um, within workforce development, we're thinking about things that include um, 
areas that will enrich the work environment for staff through education and skills training um, in best practices, and also the inclusion of trauma-informed systems of care um, training and practices, uh, and then also the supervision piece that goes with that. Um, also in this domain is really kind of taking a look at your, your staff makeup and hiring practices and what kind of language is used um, when you're when you're looking at the hiring process and also uh, job descriptions, are they trauma informed? Are they inclusive of making sure that staff has the training that they need to to really be able to come in and perform at their best in a supportive environment? So the next domain uh, is organizational structure. This one involves local health departments being able to identify existing strengths while also developing additional ways to explore components of their own organizational structure that uh, support behavioral and mental health through internal and also external activities. Um, systemically supported trauma-informed policies is a part of this, um, quality improvement measures, and also pathways for sustainable financing to increase a local health department's ability to address behavioral and mental health community concerns. So the third domain that we see here is um, another key focus within the guidance document. This one aims to ensure teams will know how to respond when a client actually walks through the door. So it's really kind of creating that workflow process that all staff know, understand, and value. Um, a clinical workflow can act as a guide uh, to not only provide an equitable process for clients, but also allows staff a guided, to pro to a guided process to follow with each client um, and also their specific needs. It includes exploring the addition of uh, things like screening tools, um, and creating seamless communication across the organization and also enhancing the referral process. So lastly, let's take a look at uh, community efforts that's listed here. Um, here, public health professionals can really start by mapping the assets that are currently in their community um, that may or may not be well known, um, building effective partnerships with those other organizations in their communities and counties um, up to and including formal MOUs, and also creating the infrastructure to maintain those relationships. Um, additionally, community efforts include defining relevant data and also creating methods for sharing that data among other collaborating organizations and what that, that data sharing process would and could look like. So let's eavesdrop again on Aaron and Tom um, to listen to them talk a little bit more about the importance of finding opportunities to bring about change and also the ripple effect that this can have. So you have seen a shift in the attitudes of your staff over the last five years? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, they understand now too. And, you know, we talk about these things because that's the one thing too. Let's talk about it. Instead of talking about it after the tragedy, mm -hmm. let's talk about it before the tragedy. We've just come through the month of May. And, you know, May was, was always that month. It was so many things going on, school year coming to an end proms, graduations, Mother's Day, all this stuff that's happening in there, you know, end of the school term. And, and it, it was hard for me to, to understand how can this time be so um, hopeless for somebody? You know, how could it be that way? And, and, and then we, be, we began to understand a little bit deeper, you know, what was going on, that the end of that structure meant somebody was maybe having to go back into a hopeless situation again mm -hmm. and they didn't want to face it or you know whatever whatever uh, personal circumstances or tragedies they may face within their families and there were some that were quite you know intense we found out um but but we worked that way and the other thing we did is we we really did some effort to reach out to our educators in the, in the county and all the different school districts to say, look, this is a big thing now, you know, just like we want all of our kids to have all of their, you know, vaccinations so that they can stay physically healthy. We have to, we have to start looking at them from a, you know, holistic perspective and, and think about what their life is like and, and, and what kind of pressures might they be bringing with them on a day-to-day -day basis into, into schools and classrooms. And uh, one, one 
superintendent uh, summed it up for me, I think, the best. He says, yeah, Tom, he says, a kid's not going to think very, very well if he doesn't have a house that he's living in. And he's not going to be very optimistic if, you know, it, it's the start of, of, of baseball season and he can't even – he can't play because there's no fees, you know, fee involved or, or can't get a pair of shoes or, or some of those things that some of us would take as being really minor, but really, really affected the a child, you know, an adolescent in, in a profound manner. Mm. And so, you know, again, we started thinking forward and trying to say, okay, what can we do to, to make sure that those pressures aren't there? And, and if they do exist, that we might be able to see them in advance and, and make a little, adjustment somewhere you know somebody being kind buying a kid a pair of cleats you know <laughs> if that's gonna if that's gonna save a life i'll buy them all day long <laughs> those those are the those are the things that that really they don't sound like much but as an intervention for one person it can be exceptionally profound and exceptionally impactful oh. so from an organizational standpoint you know the the frame that we've been using is for your health department thinking about the workforce needs and opportunities kind of your organizational structure and how to shift some things clinical workflow that you can kind of work some of these pieces in and, and also community efforts mm -hmm. um, and one of my favorite quotes is, is something to the effect of when taking your first steps direction is more important than distance as long as yeah. you're heading in the right direction, at least you're you're going to be making the progress you want to make, even if it takes a while. Right. So I'm curious on now that you've been a little more involved in the the development of this tool and kind of mm -hmm. how we're breaking it apart and wanting to engage more departments in it. Um, what's that been like? And do you have any kind of overall thoughts about this strategy? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the, the major components that made it so overwhelming for me at the very beginning was I saw that, like, you know, we, this was an enormous issue and we had no, we had no idea how to start nothing, you know? And, um, when, when we decided, okay, we're going to do these things. It was, it was really breaking it down to the ridiculous because I'm in one of those positions, Aaron, where if we have a, a, a programmatic change that we're trying to make, you know, we always sit there as administrators and we look at it and say, what's this going to cost? Can we afford mm -hmm. it? Where's the money going to come from? You know what? I didn't care about that at all. It was like, this matters not. Um, we'll find it somehow. You know, we will we will beg, we will borrow, we would do whatever we had to do to, to make it start happening. But we were realistic about it. You know, we weren't going to be able to have a, uh, here's a single pill, take it, everything is beautiful again. No, this was going to be an absolute long haul and there's work involved with it. But I got to tell you, the work was not as backbreaking as I thought it, it, the, the rewards of it were fabulous because I was able to see it not just in the health department patients or the clientele, but I could see it in my staff mm. when they started changing things and they bought into this, which they have, you know, it, it made a profound difference difference just the the office was a better place to be you know they didn't they didn't bicker about little things as often as it seemed they had in in the past and when they work together all the time those things happen i i challenge any health department or any mm -hmm. office to tell me that those things don't come up but but that you know there was there was more of a more of a, a concerted effort by everybody to make people realize that yeah you know, when you come to see us at the health department, we, we really are working for your, you know, to better your health and not just physically, you know, every component about that. I, I don't really want to go deep into the weeds, Aaron, but, you know, we've extended this into our maternal and child health program. Mm -hmm. We've put this into our family planning program. We've put this into every single program that we've got. And for those 
of you that are using electronic health records, it's just basically adding a couple of few things to your notes so that during the course of your appointments, you're maybe asking a few extra questions and you do it conversationally. But if you do those right and you're using them in the right framework, they're going to tell you things. You know, we've seen, um, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a, a really unique response in family planning of all places. Uh, imagine a person comes in and they don't know if they are and they test and they find out they're pregnant. Okay. The range of emotion that they can show on that test result is immense. A lot of them and the vast majority of them are happy. They're thrilled. Some of them are not too happy at all. And then you have some that are absolutely mortified by this. So, you know, understanding again, what our clients are, are going through or, the, or those people are and being able to adapt what we have learned to then ask the proper question. How are you feeling? Are you okay? Do you need some additional resources? How can we help you? So that they don't walk out of there feeling alone or, you know, uh, hopeless. That's it. Um, and we do it anyway. Those programs are funded for us. And it's just adding this additional component because mental health is public health. And, and I, I guess that's going to be the motto on my business card. You know? and, 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 I'm, and I'm certainly not a psychologist. I, I'm a public administrator, for goodness sake. And if I can do it, anybody can. This is an example of the community ef community efforts domain that uh, is within the guidance document, and it illustrates uh, here the design of the tiered approaches that I spoke about a little bit earlier. A um, health department can really start with any domain, whether that be workforce development or clinical workflow, and at any level of activity that they see as a viable starting point based on their current structure, practices, um, capacity, size, uh, and in Kansas, um, also their level of rurality um, also makes a difference. The tools in this guidance document um, can really help expand horizons around what can be offered within uh, behavioral health and mental health in order to impact community well-being. Yeah, I think one of our hopes is that, you know, this isn't a toolkit that's going to you're going to pull it up and get all the answers, right? But it's right. a conversation starter amongst partners, amongst other health departments. So you can start to figure out what are others doing, where are they kind of expanding their horizons and, and trying new things so we can learn from one another. From a, a truly public health perspective, I have struggled for years and years and years to prove that what we do works, mm -hmm. you know, um, and you cannot do that sometimes when disease is absent. People don't believe you that it's the efforts that you put in that help create that. But when we can go from where we were, mm -hmm. you know, a very short time ago to coming in to having zero suicides, you know, and, and um, you know, even fewer, perhaps, you know, get, getting the attempts down. Um, that's powerful stuff. Uh, yeah. that, that, that is something that I'll, I'll walk away at the end of my career and say, you know what, we made a difference. What we did made a difference and uh, saves, save somebody's life. That's, that's, you don't have to pay me to do that. That's just what we do. Something that we hear with valid concern is some of the barriers and or hesitations that health departments see in front of them around adding in behavioral and mental health activities. This can often hinder their efforts in, in really finding that place to start. Some of the common barriers expressed uh, first and foremost uh, are around really knowing where to start and how to assess their own readiness within their organization or current structure. So things asking questions like if we start small, what will or could be the impact or outcome? What domain do we start with? Uh, really kind of finding and creating that opportunity can sometimes be a difficulty to get started. Next is usually concerns about funding, uh, financial aspects of an organization, and then leading into that sustainability piece. 
the questions around if we start it, uh, how or what will be our opportunity or ability to be able to continue to fund it. One example might be if we start to um, implement into our policy trauma-informed training for all of our staff, is this something that we will have funding to continue for the long term? Another barrier expressed is often around current staffing capacity, and then rounding out the top hesitations is kind of based in hearing someone else in the community is already providing behavioral and mental health services. They're not wanting to step on toes or kind of create some of those turf issues um, or duplicate services. So while these barriers are real, they are also really workable. You can start small. You can coordinate efforts so that they involve more of that multidisciplinary team approach across sectors of uh, your community. You have heard from Tom talk about this with Aaron and have heard the different examples that he's given about the difference this has actually made not only to his staff, but um, to the clients of their health department and kind of the community at large. There can be collaborations within the community to enhance communication and create maybe either additional or different access to services uh, by streamlining referrals or finding where the health department can begin to add in tools like screening questions that provide more insight on maybe what a client is needing at that moment in time or could benefit from in the long term. It's really Really more about um, looking at those barriers, but also coming from a lens of how can we help our clients be seen and heard at all levels of all of the systems that they're accessing for help. Tom does bring a perfect perfect example of overcoming hesitations and how to hurdle over what barriers seem to be present at the moment. So let's take a listen. Well, thinking about uh the efforts that you've been putting in over the years, what are some of the biggest barriers that you've encountered in this work? And I'm thinking about this in terms of advice for other health departments that are, are ready to jump in and start doing some of these things. I think there's going to be naysayers no matter what you do. And the biggest obstacle that I faced was my own doubt that it that we would be successful. I didn't think we would have the the sway, you know, that, that we would convince people. I, 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 th I thought about some of the, the initiatives that we've got going on in our local school districts. And I'm like, they're not going to believe me. You know, I'm going to come in and I'm going to talk to a board of education and they're not going to, they're not going to, they're not going to buy in. And the superintendents just slayed me. <laughs> you know, I, I figured I had to, I had to really sell it hard to them. What, what we wanted to get accomplished in law enforcement, I thought, man, they're not going to, these people have rushed to this. And one of the superintendents looked at me and said, Tom, he says, there's no one of us in this room that wants to be the guy that stands up and says, we're against suicide prevention, you know? And, and, and it didn't, it didn't even dawn on me, but, but the magnitude of the issue creates an almost automatic acceptance of it. And so then of course comes the, well, how do we fund this? You know, that's the next barrier. And how do we, how do we find dollars to make things happen? And in that realm, we had to do what we've always done. And I think sometimes what those of us in administration and public health do the best, we had to start looking for grant opportunities and writing for grants. Yeah, you know, and it didn't matter how big or how small it was, you know, a couple thousand dollars here, you know, ten thousand dollars there, whatever it is, we had the plan. Once we had that framework there, we knew exactly what we were writing for, mm -hmm. and that made it so much easier to where we could fill the stuff in and we could describe it, and we would have conversations with with funding partners, and they would listen to us and they'd say, yeah. I think this is this is what we want to be involved in. You know, how much did you need? 10? How about we make it 15? And I'm like, what? You know, okay, great. It, that is what that well-developed plan and that little bit of effort already that we've put into it have brought forth. You know, they say that, you know, your your preparation 
and your, you know, your education, all of these things coalesce together to make you lucky at some point in time. That's exactly what it was. Oh, you're lucky that you got this. No, we were just prepared. This where we were at. We were, we were passionate about it. We could show people what we were doing and how we were trying to do it. We don't know if it's going to be ultimately successful down the road, but we know that if we did nothing, it was going to be tragic. And so by getting as many people involved and getting the community involved and then, you know, asking, you know, the, the, the school districts, can you put a few bucks into the pot, you know, and, and we'll throw some in and, and, and you get a collaborative set up like that. It becomes um, not just available to start, but I think what it, what it is going to create over time now is a sustainable model because it will be that important that, that we'll continue to see it funded. And, um, you know, even within the state of Kansas, it has become um, a, a, a top item list. So if, you, if you're if you sitting there thinking, oh, there's not going to be money or we're not going to get anywhere, you, you've got to let that go. You've got to put that out of your head. You've got to start, you know, pick up this framework, look at it. Where are you best situated in this in this in this realm? Do the things that you can do the best. Tweak those little things and watch the results and, and track it. That's the other thing. You've got to track this stuff to, to some extent to show, you know, who, who you're talking to and what you're doing. Jumping into some recommendations, things that we've learned from Tom so far include um, pick up this framework take a look at it or if there's another framework that you that you have that you want to maybe combine efforts um just start somewhere find some place to start and approach it without fear and hesitation um, feel like you're going to be successful from the start ask yourself where are we best suited to start as an organization asking those internal questions asking those ex external questions of at our current state of practice what can we add in at this time um, and just do the things that you can do the best at create and maintain those partnerships um, there's something so incredibly valuable about um, cross-sector collaborations or multidisciplinary team collaborations, people begin to, to come out of working in those silos and really start working from a team perspective. It doesn't always mean that you have to share all of the information or details about clients, but sometimes it's just knowing what one person is doing or what one organization is doing and what they bring to the holistic approach to behavioral health and mental health services and access for clients in your community um, can really, really, truly make a difference. Um, and I know one of the quotes that Tom said earlier was, if we do nothing, we know that it's going to be tragic. Yeah, you know, the, the, this type of a, this type of an interaction is uh, really pretty neat. Um, I'm just, I feel humbled that, you know, I was able to start something just with a question. And I, I think that people should um, learn from that experience. Don't think that you don't think that you're not worried to ask the question or to bring the topic up. Um, that's, that would have been, I could have sat there and been too timid or, or shy, but you know me, I'm not that way and, and wouldn't have asked, but uh, that, that I think was, was probably the, the greatest single thing I've done uh, in my public health career was ask that question. Does anybody have any answers? Because we don't know. I, I mean, I just want to thank you personally for for taking it back to them and saying, hey, we got to do something uh, and, and doing the, the research and, you know, creating this, you know, template to begin with and, and then letting us sit there and hash it out and bang it around. One of the things I do know we what we talked about and I, and I want to tell this to every administrator that's out there. We looked at it from the framework of how would I feel when I saw this? Oh, it's just another toolbox. It's just mm -hmm. another toolkit. And I'm just going to, I don't have time for this. We did not want it to be that, you know, we wanted it to be an absolute framework that you could adapt 
to fit your organization, to fit your county, to fit your clientele, so that it could be for Cowley County, or Cloud County, or Shawnee County, or Seward County. It does not matter. Take this, see what, you, what you've got, work from your strengths, and then ask for help with the weaknesses, and it will happen. It, it really is. You just have to, you have to want to, and, and I'm thrilled that the partnership from WSU, again, will, will help put this kind of up uh, in, the, in the forefront so people can see it, look at it, and, and have an opportunity to, to pick it up and make it their own. That's my challenge to everybody out there that's in my spot. You know, if I can do it, you can do it too. So pick it up and let's go. Let's see well, what happens. I'll add to that, Tom. I think you've inspired a handful of folks, including my staff, when 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 that exact thing comes up, and your your response is always, "Why not us? Why not yeah. now?" Exactly. What are we waiting for? Yeah. We are so thankful to Tom for his transparency in this process, and also his tremendous effort, and the the things that he's continuing to do with all of the partners um, and community members that he's engaged so far. Um, we also have other health departments in Kansas. If you take a look at the framework and the guidance document that we have for you um, to utilize, you can see that we have learned so much from them as well, and they lent to this framework by providing input and practical examples of the work that they're doing to make a difference for their staff, their clients, and their community members. Don't wait. The time is right now. We want to thank you for taking t the time to listen in today to learn more about the efforts in Kansas um, to positively impact behavioral and mental health and overall community well-being. We'll leave you with this last message from Tom. We're excited about the progress we've made in what's going on here. And we hope that we can continue to demonstrate how it, how it will work. And, you know, if people want to call and, and chat with us and see how we're doing it, or just come by and, and, and visit, we'll do it. We'll, we'll, we'll co-op with you guys and help put on workshops, whatever it takes to, to make this more and more of a reality, I think is, is what we need to do. And, and I hope everybody will, will, see where we're coming from this is not this isn't made up and we're certainly not you know mm -hmm. uh we're, we're not trying to sell you know a, a bag of goods i mean this is this is a good a, a good progression a good point to be at based upon where i am today on june 1st 2023 and where i was in june 1st you know 2019 it's just that's not that far away that's that and a lot has happened in that time period so i'm i'm thrilled with it and and i hope everybody else can you know share in that excitement and that passion that we've got so yeah that's it yeah well i really want to thank you tom i mean i think your your passion your willingness to share and kind of help guide this process along well to start a lot of this process yeah. but then to guide it along to where it is i mean i don't think we can ever thank you enough for everything uh, that you've done. And, and thank you so much for sharing because I know uh, we, we really want to kind of get things moving and get more conversations going so that we can help others. Please feel free to reach out to any of us here. We'd love to have a conversation about this project or to be able to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you.